Let me come back now to, I mean, what it says is that the priority would be lending to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, with the kind of capital base, you know, you said uh, 100 billion is the uh, equity and out of which 50% has been uh, subscribed at this, at this point in time. Now, with that, what is the kind of lending portfolio that the new development bank can hope to achieve? Well, let me tell you what is the World Bank's IBRD loan portfolio. As of now, the stock is about 135 billion. So we're not talking about uh, uh, a bank which is very small by comparison. I think, uh, uh, as was being mentioned, this bank and the other collaborative efforts, we learn by doing. Now. Uh, many projects don't see the light of the day because the seed money is not uh, available. So I have a feeling that when you talk about infrastructure, governments will also have to provide some of that funding and multilateral funding will be perhaps co-funding, uh, bridge funding, perhaps the initial funding. So it can play a big role. Uh, but I would not only focus on this bank. I want to throw it to all three of you that, you know, this could be the beginning of economies of scale. When you look at these five countries for projects in civilian aircraft construction, there are only two companies which really produce aircraft that the whole world buys. True. Nuclear power on the civilian side, uh, oil and gas pipelines. There are at least uh, uh, Brazil and Russia have a lot of oil and gas. And finally, pharmaceutical products. If you think a little bit about it, all four areas that I have mentioned, the well-known names are all in countries other than these five countries. So I have a feeling that while you mentioned about the new development bank and what it, what it could do on in infrastructure funding, but if you have a forum where there's no problem about population, in purchasing power parity terms, these five countries make up 28% of global GDP, so you have the purchasing power, you have the economies of scale, you have the markets. So I think a lot can be achieved. Can, can this bank, uh, in a sense, compete or can it give loans which are at more attractive rates uh, as compared to, let's say, the World Bank, which is the traditional lender? Uh, this bank can lend at a rate substantially lower than the IBRD. I've written about this, but I don't know whether uh, I can explain it in simple terms, but look at it this way. Uh, all these countries have some amount of their reserves, foreign exchange reserves, China and India particularly, invested in short-term, three-month or less, treasury bills yeah. of the US and other developed countries. Now, the rate of return on that, and uh, if you use uh, a spread to a well-known benchmark like six-month LIBOR, it would be something like LIBOR minus 40. The World Bank lends at LIBOR plus 60 or more, uh, usually LIBOR plus 1 percent. So your opportunity cost of capital is LIBOR minus 40 basis points. So in other words, what you are saying is for the benefit of our viewers that this bank can provide loans at marginally more attractive rates as compared to the World Bank. We'll take a break at this point and return. Welcome back. We are assessing the outcome of the recently concluded BRICS summit. Another announcement in addition to the new development bank was the announcement relating to the $100 billion contingency reserve arrangement. Can you throw some light on what this is expected to achieve? But this is more kind of akin to the IMF arrangement, which is balance of payments difficulties. And of course, IMF has much more firepower than 100 billion. But uh, to begin with, I think this is again a very sizable amount. If a country were to get into difficulties out of these five, which I don't see happening uh, in the near term at all, uh, then uh, some uh, funds would be made available out of this contingency reserve fund uh, to, to help that country tide over its balance of payments difficulties. In addition to the multilateral aspect, there was also a lot of attention focused mm -hmm. on Prime Minister Modi's key bilateral meetings, particularly with President Putin of Russia and with President Xi Jinping of China. So let's come to the Chinese uh, meeting first. And WPS, if I may turn to you, 
Um, he, Prime Minister Modi has, uh, the meeting was supposed to last for 80 minutes. Mm -hmm. It lasted much, or oh, 40 minutes. It, it lasted, lasted 80, for 80 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Prime Minister Modi has been invited to the APEC summit and so on. What is the takeaway from this meeting? Well, clearly, uh, you know, uh, the bilaterals are going to be as important as the multilateral and more so because, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi is perhaps the newest entrant into this group of five at the moment. And they're all going to see out, uh, in my opinion, uh, at least the next five or uh, in the case of China, even longer than that. Uh, the only question mark is really on Dilma Rauf, uh, you know, partly because the elections... She has elections coming up. Coming yeah. up, and they lost the World Cup. Uh, that's a dangerous <laughs> combination. But yeah. I think despite that, she will come back. So there's going to be a greater degree of continuity there. But on China, I think it's absolutely uh, the first time that they're meeting as prime minister and ahead of China, and that's an important uh, messaging. But I think there's a sense uh, also of how... China may have risen in priority vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Japan, for example. Yes. Uh, and this may cause some cons consternation in Tokyo and perhaps an equal amount of uh, comfort, shall we say, in Beijing. So I think it's, it's off to a good start, but I think certainly Beijing would have to deliver uh, because this could change quite, quite dramatically if you know, there isn't forward movement. As, as one is sort of expected. But I think certainly the rhetoric was right, but there are perhaps the biggest issues among the BRICS is between India and China. So in a sense, that is a crucial relationship which can actually sort of become the key driver, as it were. If this relationship moves forward well, then the BRICS as a forum uh, develops much greater potential. Absolutely. I mean, for example, just take one instance in the declaration. Uh, you know, both Russia and China have been far less wholesome in their support of the Security Council reforms than others have been. And I think part of it well, is... The, the two are already there in the Security precisely. Council, and the, it is the other three who want, who to, want join. to be there. Precisely. And I think part of this has to do with the India-China dynamics. Was that to change, uh, you know, very fundamentally, I think you would see a much more wholesome support of the other three coming onto the Security Council. And that, for me, actually, would be a key marker. Indrani, another uh, invitation, if I remember correctly, coming out was um, from the Chinese uh, to, to the Indian side was to deepen India's engagement with the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation yeah. Organization, something which we have been wanting to do where we are currently as an observer. Do you think, what are the prospects of that happening? You know, I, uh, here I have to say that I'm very skeptical. I have seen the Chinese uh, formulation on the UN, on India joining the UN Security Council, uh, and the formulation is almost exact, which is we would like to see India deepen its, uh, in its uh, participation or involvement. Uh, and uh, he said almost the same thing with the SEO. The SEO is uh, uh, Chinese controlled. I am reasonably certain they don't want India there more than uh, its current uh, um, participation. Mm, but on the APEC, uh, on the APEC uh, invitation, I think that is interesting because we have always expected the APEC invitation to come from either Australia or the U.S. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and, uh, to, and, uh, uh, to, and the, it has always been sort of believed that China may object to an Indian uh, participation. Now, obviously, an, a, an invitation to the APEC summit is not tantamount to an Indian invitation to membership because that has to be by consensus. Um, but it would it it be interesting to see whether it opens the door for the U.S., uh, which is this year looking for ways to uh, uh, sort of deepen its engagement with Modi, uh, has actually thought about uh, inviting uh, India to APEC. Uh, did the Chinese steal a march over the U.S.? Possibly. It was probably a good political move by Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. I would say. Dr. Bhagwati, he also had a very important bilateral meeting with President Putin. And uh, he has invited President Putin, uh, who's expected to visit India later this year. And he's invited him to visit, I think, uh, Kudan Kulam. So what do you have as an assessment of the meeting with President Putin? I think it was from, I only have access to press reports and the websites of Government of India, including the Ministry of External Affairs. And my sense is it is a very good 
uh, meeting. Uh, President Putin knows India very well. He's attended a number of these annual summit meetings um, when he has been president of Russia. We have a very, very important defense uh, relationship with them, which neither side can overlook. We also have a long uh, uh, tradition of, of consulting with each other about trouble spots around the world. And you know India's position, whether it was Syria or whether it was Ukraine, is not quite the position of some of the G7 countries, which would not have gone unnoticed in Russia. And perhaps the two leaders discuss some of these trouble spots. We know what's going on in Palestine and, uh, and, and the Gaza Strip and so on. Perhaps that was discussed. I, I don't quite know. Uh, my sense is that relationship is on an even keel and to some extent, not because the relationship is contracting, but because the relationship with other countries is expanding. In relative terms, that relationship is contracting. I think uh, the three of you talked about the India-China factor. There are five countries in the UN Security Council. There are five countries in BRICS. It's, I'm sure, uh, not relevant at well. all. <laughs> but the point I was about to make was that these two countries, India and China, through the relationship, have a veto on the success or failure of BRICS. Well, that is true. I think we come back to the same conclusion that uh, the sixth summit has marked a new beginning for BRICS, but the India-China relationship will actually hold the key to how successful this new grouping can be in its new avatar. Further, we've also talked a little bit about the bilaterals and the importance of these bilaterals, and in months to come, Prime Minister Modi's diplomatic agenda is going to get even heavier. Uh, we have a multi among the multilateral engagements, we have the United Nations General Assembly, the SARC Summit, the G20, and now, of course, the APEC Summit. And among the bilaterals, we have visits to China, we have uh, visits, to uh, Japan. visits from China and Russia, and a visit to Japan, as US. well as uh, meeting mm -hmm. with the U.S. President in Washington, D.C., so the diplomatic agenda for the new government is certainly evolving into a very crowded and a very important agenda. This brings us to the end of this edition of Wide Angle. Thank you for watching.